Welcome everyone to session D, the art of coaching authentic projects. I am joined um, on this panel with Jessica Immel, Ann Jones, and Ben Owens, and they've brought special guests with them as well. This will be a bit of a conversation as well as um, back and forth. I hope that you all feel comfortable using the chat box for questions. I'm moderating. Um, Jessica brings with her Donna Fine, Anne brings with her Karen Cho, and Ben brings with him Amity Gus and Dave, I'm going to butcher it, I want to say potluck now because I wrote it down wrong, so I'm sorry, <laughs> Dave, <laughs> Plotkin. <laughs> um, thanks all for joining us. I look forward to our conversation today. Um, to kick us off, I think what we should do is allow uh, panelists to give your introductions and um, perhaps share a little bit about your perspective on why experiential learning is important as we think about the future of learning, especially within the context of authentic, learner-centered, community-facing work um, that allow our students to thrive and especially for those students who have been historically marginalized. So that's a lot <laughs> intro and then grounded in your own experience and your perspectives. Um, Jessica, you are directly next to me. So I'm gonna hand off to you first. Okay, yeah, thanks Lydia. And, and welcome everybody this afternoon. I'm excited to see everybody. Um, I'm Jessica Immel from Bentonville, Arkansas, and I teach global business in the CAPS program here for the Bentonville School District. Um, that was a big question, Lydia, uh, about the future of learning. So I, I think the example I want to give is uh, I, I had a student named Casey who worked with the Walmart Energy team, and she was lucky enough to get an internship there. And I think one of the things, because this was kind of earlier on in my CAPS experience, is that when she got into that internship and started working with electric vehicle chargers and putting those out you know, at various stores across the U.S. She started to put together things that she learned from economics, from civics, from her physics class. I mean, she was pulling in everything. It was very, you know, cross-disciplinary. And it really kind of, you know, as a, a senior year experience, highlighted how just interconnected all these things were. And I don't think without this authentic experience that she may have had that kind of capstone experience. So as far as like, you know, why is it important? I think, you know, right before they go out and, and do some big things, that it's really important that they start to put those things together. Thank you, Jessica. I'll just go across the row. Anne, you're next on my screen, if you don't mind introducing yourself and uh, sharing. I'd some love to, yeah, I threw a, um... Jessica, you got me thinking stories here. Thanks for that wonderful story. I threw in Jordan's story. Uh, feel free to watch that later, but I thought in case you'd be interested. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm the co-founder of District C. District C is a nonprofit um, and we really are working with educators across the country to learn how to be great coaches of this profession-based learning. So that's kind of the intersection that we're involved with. Karen, who's Karen Cho, who's with me here today is uh, right now in the training to become a District C certified coach and take this work back to her school. The reason why this work matters, not so dissimilar from what Jessica said, right? At the end of the day, this is about young people and the fact that they can add real value. And Jordan's story, interestingly enough, she was uh, asked to be a part of a District C program. School called her mom, whose name is Melissa. They said, hey, Melissa, uh, we'd really love Jordan to be a part of this, this thing called District C. And Melissa says to the person on the other end of the phone, that's great, um, but don't you mean Nia, Jordan's twin sister, who was always the one that got called to do and invited to do everything? And they said, no, we actually mean Jordan. Jordan is, is a self-described wallflower. And if you get a chance to watch this video, uh, her District C experience was working with a team of three other students who she'd never met from different schools, different parts of the region. 
and she worked with those students and was coached through the process of solving a real problem for a local business, a local business that she'd never met, never heard of, didn't know what they did, et cetera. And one of the phrases in the video is Jordan says, this increased my confidence by a thousand percent. She found her voice um, in this work. She saw herself now as someone that was able to add real value to make a difference. Um, and she has this great quote in there. She says, it's already inside of you. You just need someone to help pull it out. So I think that's the real value of this work is we as educators have a real opportunity to reach out to these students. It is already inside of them. We can help them pull it out. Beautiful, thank you, Anne. Ben Owens, would you take the floor, please? Sure thing. Uh, hey, everybody, good to see you all here. Um, and gosh, you both inspired me to <laughs> also drop a, a video link. This gives a uh, snapshot of a project uh, that uh, we did. Yes, and watch it later. Uh, so you can focus on this for now. But uh, this, this was an example of a uh, school-wide cross-curricular cross-grade level project that we did at Tri-County Early College where I had the privilege of teaching for 11 years um, after a 20-year engineering career um, which I, I can talk about why, why I made that crazy move uh, later which is still a little bit of a sore spot to my wife um, but uh, best job I ever had uh, teaching in that uh, PBL environment teaching math and physics and STEM um, but in a cross-curricular way and really community facing how do we get students making a difference today rather than just assuming that we know how to teach them the things that they will need in order to make a difference later so um, that was the the thing that sort of changed my paradigm about how we can use uh, authentic experiential learning that has students working directly with folks in the community making a difference now. Um, and it's life changing. I mean, our school, we had a target population of first generation college goers, students who were at risk of dropping out, uh, minorities, uh, low socioeconomic um, populations, et cetera. And the overwhelming majority of our students met one or more of those, those criteria. And yet we were consistently able to get 100% of them accepted into college. Uh, and then if they wanted to go, that's great, but they at least had the capacity to do that. Um, and just seeing how the life vector was changed for so many students just made me an absolute believer that this is the way that we should be teaching our students. So that they're, yes, they're developing the academic skills that the state says you have to have, but they're developing so much more beyond that. That was alluded to by Jessica and Ann. Uh, they're, they are able to, uh, to do the kind of work that we need in, in today's global economy. So uh, that's why I'm passionate about this kind of work. Yeah, this is this is um, one one thing that I'm hearing, you know, across like contacts across schools and districts is really um, how are the ways that we engage our students and what are our approaches along those lines? I'm curious about um, how coaching looks different in something that is more profession based learning as opposed to traditional environments. So you know, when we think of traditional sage on a stage, hopefully we're not doing that yeah. very much versus, you know, real world, authentic community facing projects. What does, what does um, coaching look like? And I'll open it up for the three of you to bounce back and forth before I throw you another question. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to jump in. And um, if it's okay, Karen, I'd love to hear too, your perspective as someone that is in the middle of this, but you know, that it's funny you mentioned, Lydia, this whole sage on the stage, guide on the side. And I think um, as a former middle school or science teacher, you know, I wanted to be the guide on the side. But as I started to engage with more authentic, profession-based, messy problems, I kind of think I went quiet. Like, I think I became, like, I got this idea that I shouldn't be up in front with, you know, I'm, I know and I communicate. Like, I understood all of that. But, and we see this with a lot of our coaches where, all of a sudden they understand they wanna build agency in students. They wanna sort of turn the reins over to the students, but you kind of just go quiet because you're not really sure what's your role. Like, what should I be doing as a coach? What should I actually be saying? So the two things that I would say from our perspective at District C is, you know, really coach on process, 
in these kinds of experiences. But when you're thinking about the process, think of both about the problem solving process and the team dynamic part of the process, right? And so, you know, um, so one example that I, that I was thinking of with this was we had some students that were in a team solving a problem for Fleet Feet Sports, which is, you know, one of those stores where you go if you're like a hardcore runner and you love to run and run clubs and like you really want to go to a store where you can talk to people who know shoes and, and like it's Fleet Feet Sports is that kind of a store. And they sponsor a ton of races like everybody calls them up. They have, we have a 5k for this or we have a 10k for that. So the the company came to the to the students and said hey we're dealing we're getting like 100 emails a week just trying to like manage all these people who are asking us to sponsor these races and we don't we're like getting totally buried so what do we do about that so let me tell you sort of from the student's perspective as a coach the, the question is then like how does coaching on process how do you do that what does it sound like well the first thing is we're really going to coach them on what we call the mindsets and the tools so we know that our students have an interview. They got 45 minutes with this business. So we're going to do some front end work to say, we really want you to get into this like problem solving mindset, right? Be curious, dig, ask questions. What's motivating you know, Matt and Jordan who were, were from Fleet Feet Sports there to talk about this problem. We coach them on the questioning tool, right? We practice this. How do you really ask questions in a way that gets people talking? that gets them talking not just about information, but emotion, what motivates them, right? What needs do they, and, and, then, and then we sort of turn them loose, right? And you let the students go into this. So as I'm watching the students in the interview, this is the sort of a second piece of this, I'm coaching on process, but I'm really watching carefully as they're doing the work, as they're playing the game, so to speak, I'm watching really carefully to see where's, where am I seeing evidence that they're starting to get the hang of this? What's a question they asked that was like, oh, that was so good. That really got to emotion. I'm gonna write that down. Why? Because I'm gonna bring that back to students in the debrief. I'm gonna say, Nathan, wow, great questions, Matt and Jordan, when you said, but da, 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 I feel in it. Do you see how that really got him talking about what the real, what, what he's really experiencing here? right, which is, which is real frustration about trying to get on the same page with the client, whatever the case may be. Same thing applies for the team dynamic, right? So if you coach on process for problem solving and team dynamic, it's, it's the same experience, right? How do you use this same questioning tool to really get to know the people on your team, to learn about it? What makes them tick? Not just what activities do they do after school? Why are they here? What do they care about? We're going to use that same coaching tool. Then again, watch carefully, observe carefully. Where do you see evidence that they're starting to really invest in each other? And then as a coach, I'm going to lift that up. So that was a huge shift for me. Like from honestly, this experience where I kind of just went silent because I didn't want to like always be bossy. But then I had to really figure out like what to say. But Karen, as someone that's like smack in the middle of this, like, and, and someone that teaches core academic classes. I'd just love to get your thoughts on this too. Yes, for sure. Um, I loved how Anne highlighted how we are coaching students to use the tools. In a traditional environment, oftentimes the end goal often ends up being the content. And then it's our hope as teachers and coaches that in the process of learning that content, students also gain the skills um, that they need to critically think and problem solve. But in an experiential learning environment, that focus shifts a little bit. So students are coached on the tools um, and challenged to actually problem solve and think critically in order to access the knowledge and access the insights. And I think one thing that's so valuable and beautiful about that sort of environment is that as a coach, um, I oftentimes don't know the answer. So, and I'm not expected to know the answer because I'm, I'm learning and discovering new things alongside the students who are using those same skills. Um, and I think there's something very beautiful about that uncertainty because uh, typically as coaches and teachers, we want to know how everything's gonna turn out. Um, but I, I've, learned to lean in to that sort of uncertainty and the the chaos a little bit 
I think that really speaks also to the trust that you're building between your students and yourselves as educators, as coaches, because you can't reveal those sort of like vulnerabilities as easily if you haven't established those relationships. Um, so thank you for speaking to the chaos and the messiness, Karen. Other panelists, go ahead, Jessica. Yeah, so um, I 100% agree with Anne. I think we kind of feel those things about when you, you know, letting them take the reins over, it being a little scary, absolutely. So I guess I'll speak to more like the execution of it. So I typically run four or five what we call client projects in the fall semester. So, you know, maybe 10 day exposure projects. And the reason we do that is I teach business. And so my first year, I thought, you know, a lot of students would come in and go, well, you know, I want to do an accounting project or I want to do a marketing project, but they hadn't been exposed to enough areas to where they could decide what was appropriate for them. So then the thought was, we, we just want to expose them to everything. So we run client projects in, you know, one in supply chain, one in entrepreneurship, one in analytics, one in marketing. So they kind of get a sense of, I said, I like business, but maybe it's over here or over here. So I would go to business and ask, you know, what's the 10th thing on your to-do list, that typical CAPS question. And then day one, the client would come in and, and pitch the project. And then day two and three, the students were kind of digesting what they heard, uh, maybe doing some research. Uh, and then so on through the project, an idea that I had gotten from um, Janet Graham at Blue Valley was this kind of just-in-time learning. And so not giving those lessons until the students ask for it. So maybe we're doing a marketing project and something comes up about, you know, marketing analytics. Well, then that's the perfect time to, to take a pause and do a 20 minute lesson on the marketing analytics because they're very engaged then. And then they're working through, they're working with a team, they're using their critical thinking, their problem solving. And then at the end of the 10 days, they're pitching back to the client. And we, we do 10 days because one, if they don't love the project, they can usually hang in for 10 days. And then if they do love the project, then they can go into an internship that's more like a 16 week, you know, longer term uh, project for them to take on. So that's kind of how we execute the projects. But I would say, you know, totally agree with Anne on the coaching, but I have a, a business partner with us, Donna, who's the um, director in global business services for Walmart, who's been a client, uh, project coach with us. She's been a mentor to our program and supervised some of our interns before. So Dawn, I'll ask you to unmute. And so as we think about coaching students and setting up this framework for them, there's also kind of working with coaching the business partner and turning a project into something that's digestible by a 16 or 17 year old student. So, so Donna, do you have any feedback on that that you want to share with us? Yeah, I think in one, Jessica is so organized, which from the business perspective helps us to know what to expect and makes it very easy for us. And I think that helps. But we do sometimes need coaching because we don't know, like, is this the right project for a student? Is it the right level? And, and I think sometimes you have to make sure we're not just trying to get free help, but that we also have the time to coach the students. So I think from your perspective, you're coaching both the student and the business, you know, to help us kind of make sure, especially when it's our first time to do it. Um, we're getting a lot better now, I think, Jessica, <laughs> with what to do with the students and what projects, you know, can really motivate them. And they, they see the benefit. They feel like they've really gotten something out of it. And I think because we're in business, it is so broad and so vague that they don't really know what it means. Um, and we are, you know, we kind of live in a bubble because we are a very big Walmart and vendor community, but they still sometimes didn't know what their parents do. And especially during the pandemic, they're like, they're on the computer all day long, you know. So it's been very interesting um, just to work together and kind of understand how to, how to really enlighten the students to what we do do and if it's something that they want to do in the future. But, but I would say definitely don't feel that you can't coach us because we definitely um, are welcome to that as we are trying to work through the process with you. Donna, thank you so much. I mean, you know, one of the questions I often ask is, you know, how are our business partners prepared to work with students and that intersection with their educators as well? So thank you so much for speaking to that um, that perspective and that experience and that need also, quite honestly. 
Ben, did you want to chime in? I mean, I, I, yes, but I, I, so many things have been said that I, I absolutely 100% <laughs> agree with. You know, the, uh, so I, I, what I can offer is that uh, the school that where I taught. Uh, we didn't have formal coaches in the district that we worked with or at our school. We, we did, we were part of what was called uh, North Carolina New School. So we had coaches that we would, um, you know, come in from time to time, uh, leadership and instructional coaches from a traditional sense, and they were super helpful. What, where I found the real power of this, uh, however, uh, was in the idea that anyone at any time could be a coach in this type of environment because we just lean so heavily on collaboration, collaboration with folks in the community, collaboration amongst students, collaboration among our peers. And this idea that, you know, we, that I somehow was the font of all knowledge for physics or math or, or whatever was totally wrong. And that, that sort of, you know, when you're doing messy projects that are community facing, where the answer is not in the back of the book, you've got to let that control go, uh, as Ann alluded to. And you've got to be in a position where you can say, you know, I don't know. Why don't we find out and then model what the learning process. And the, the cool thing that I saw in that is, especially when you're working on projects that students really are engaged and they care about, because it's, it's addressing a need that they can really see on a tangible level. Um, and it's not just doing abstract worksheets or whatever. Uh, they really want to learn. And it opens the door to the joy and wonder of learning again, uh, which is, you know, unfortunately somehow been beat out of them through uh, the traditional approach to, to uh, teaching that we've, we've had, unfortunately, in so many cases. So I think that's the, the thing I would, I would bring to this point is that, Yes, you do have traditional coaches in one sense, but if you can extend that definition so that anyone at any point in time who has that ability to coach that knowledge, coach that step forward using the design process, using continuous improvement, then, then you're going to really um, you know, catalyze this process in a significant way. So um, I'm going to build on that, Ben, what you were just talking about around the dynamics and what we've been talking about. Um, talk to me about formal and informal relationships within, you know, local communities or businesses. And how is the work that you're doing with students or what you are advocating in terms of experiential learning different from status quo? So, maybe go in a little bit more around that relationship between the dynamics and what's a little bit different about where you're at versus what we usually see in, in those informal and formal relationships. If I can maybe start that, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna speak, but just for a second and just simply say, I'm gonna, perhaps if Amity is okay with that, turn that question over to her and, uh, and, and Dave, uh, because we're currently working with uh, this wonderful district in uh, Old Saybrook, Connecticut. And I think they can really speak with the, the example of the work that they're doing uh, in that regard. So Amity, I, I probably pitched you a curveball there, but if you're okay with it, if you can um, talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. We have had the pleasure of working with Pen, with Ben and um, an owl to to think about like coaching at all the different levels because it's coaching learners, right? It's not about coaching just students in the scenario, but it's about all of us learners as adults as well. And I think that that's um, one of the biggest takeaways that we've had th that is so different than traditional sage on the stage kind of teaching and learning is that we're all learning from one another at the same time as adult learners to support the student learners. Um, and so, you know, we have had this long term goal um, in our strategic plan for the last five years of sort of embedding this um, learner centered experiential learning and also thinking of it separately, a collaborative, innovative professional learning communities for teachers and never saw those two goals as one thing until we experienced true experiential community facing authentic learning. And when we had that experience, we realized that we became a network of coaches for one another as we coached students. 
and it was it was the most amazing and beautiful thing. I, I think Dave can probably give more concrete examples because he was there with me, learning alongside me. Um, but he's also had the opportunity to take that to students. So, Dave. Well, sure. Um, I had gone into uh, the, the summer enrichment uh, program that we were offering with certain thoughts about how I wanted to run my enrichment course, which was going to be sort of an engineering challenge. You know, students come in. Uh, can you build X? Can you build Y? Can you build Z? And after having the week with my colleagues, uh, we totally transformed my original thought and made it much, much richer based on the feedback that I got from my colleagues and, and collaborating together and identifying through the lens of, of equity and student agency and, and a community facing components. We really built something uh, that I think my students felt was special this summer. Um, just to briefly describe what we did, um, you know, originally I was I was designing having my students maybe design lobster or crab traps because we're on the shoreline. I wanted something related on the shoreline, but it, it wasn't very authentic other than just a challenge. Can you do this? So um, I reached out to a friend of mine who happens to be a marine biologist and uh, asked him any interest in some crab data. And he said, yeah, we actually are interested in there's a couple of new invasive species in your area. But the problem is that the species are really small. So traditional crab traps won't, won't work. Um, so your students are going to have to kind of engineer uh, a new type of trap that will be able to capture this, this small, newer species. Um, so this, this marine biologist zoomed in with my students and kind of introduced the project to them. And then we hung up and they looked at me and they said, wait, uh, are we really doing this for this marine biologist? And I said, yeah, he's, he's relying on your, on your data and your sort of your success here. And they were, uh, they were blown away. Um, and we're much more motivated and engaged in, in, in uh, going forward with the project than I would have been, ever been able to, to do on my own. Um, so they, they went ahead and, and, and did that. And we had a, another project where we were gonna just design bridges, you know, uh, challenge, can you make a bridge that either holds a certain amount of weight or goes a certain length? And we happen to have um, in uh, Old Saybrook, uh, big bridge that goes over the Connecticut River, carries I-95 over the river, and we have uh, an architecture firm uh, where one of the uh, architects uh, helped to design the bridge. So he came in and visited with the students and introduced that project with them in a different twist than I would have been able to do. So uh, those experiences of having uh, a member of the community to introduce um, and drive the project forward was 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 wonderful and beyond what what I would have ever been able to do on my own. Um, so going forward into the school year, I'm really looking forward to taking that uh, experience this summer and working with my colleagues from the summer experience to take my future uh, lessons, my current lessons, I should say, and, and um, elevate them to a different level with the lens of uh, community facing equity and student agency and making sure that we're hitting uh, those high points in a way that we weren't able to do or didn't know how to do previously. Yeah, yeah. And right, all the literature says good teaching and learning is relevant and timely and authentic. What better way to do it than to actually connect through your community and, and people who have that different need and that different perspective? all to um, jump in as, as you see fit. Yeah, Lee, I'll just piggyback off of what David said. Um, Cause we've tried to do the same thing in really trying to connect our classroom to the community. And I think from, uh, you know, how we've gone about that cause I've learned a lot over the last uh, four years doing this program that we would go out and ask folks to participate and, but do it in a way that was um, respectful of their time. So we kind of tell business partners we have, you know, four ways to engage. One, you could come in as a guest speaker. And so, you know, it's just an hour of your time and, and maybe less if it's via Zoom and then making sure the students are really prepped to engage in that discussion. And then the second piece would be maybe a site visit, like, can I bring my class and come see your office space or tour your distribution facility? Um, the third piece would be maybe we could get a project like I talked about that 10th thing on your to do list. Maybe you have one of those that we could work on, but that's more time intensive than, you know, just being a guest speaker. And then the most time intensive one is facilitating an intern. And so, you know, you really have to find the right person who's willing to mentor and coach up that student. But even if someone may not be familiar with our program or, you know, is maybe not sure, you know, when I start talking about, yeah, these high school students are working on real business problems. And they're like, eh. 
but then I can get them into the classroom and come be a guest speaker. Sometimes that prompts them to go back and, and share with their team. Or it creates these feedback loops where, you know, I'm learning all the stuff that's happening in business when they come in and visit my class, which kind of, you know, helps us be more relevant in the classroom. Absolutely. Jessica, that's, it really speaks to what we've seen too, this idea of like, it's got to be feasible, um, but everybody wants impact. So I love the idea of options. I'm curious, like, how do you go after, like, how, like, how do you, how do you do outreach, right? Like, is this sort of like, here's the four options and you send out an email list to everyone in the local chamber, or is it more targeted? And if so, like, how, like what's kind of the right personas? I just love to hear more. I'm super curious. Yeah, so, and I'll bring Donna in on this one too, because she's kind of been a part of that. Just, you know, having people in the classroom and then hopefully they take that message back into their businesses and they go, hey, did you know this was happening? Or, or here's an area where you can volunteer or interact with students or mentor them. And, and of course, you know, Donna and I have talked about this, you know, it takes the right person um, to, yeah. to interact with 16 and 17 year olds. But yeah. we've had some events, like Donna and I actually met at a showcase. And she came to uh, an Ignite showcase to see her nephew who was in a different strand and then saw our setup on the business side and went, hey, what are you guys doing over here? And we just started talking. Yep. And then she's kind of helped us carry that message through different parts of Walmart. That's been very helpful. Uh, but then too, like just hitting the ground running in networking events um, and then having those folks just you know, getting someone high profile in the community and saying, hey, can you just come into my classroom and talk about decision making just for an hour? Come talk about how you, you know, approach decision making. And then they go back and share. And so it's kind of like, you know, a pebble in a river, right? And then it starts to spread a little bit. Donna, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I think one of the things that worked really well, because you're going to find there are going to be people like me that are advocates, like I think this program is amazing. And so I do go out and tell everyone. So I would say use us. Um, and then even like we, Jessica does, um, where the kids do some competitions, and so they will do presentations, and we came in and judged them. And so that was a great opportunity for me to bring a lot of people in that could see, you know, these kids are amazing to me, like, you know, and and for us to show that they have a lot of talent and then, you know, help other people get engaged. And we've had, you know, several people have gotten engaged, you know, since that. And then I will say at Walmart, like I will also set up meetings um, and it can be for everyone in Jessica's class. We can get them to tour different facilities or we will go in and just do meet and greets with some different people in key areas. And so it's just getting the word out to know what their program is and the talent that, that the students have. Um, I think that has really helped. One other um, thing I want to point out that um, kind of to answer Anne's question, you may, I know you directed it, Jessica, but yeah. uh, it, it spawned an idea. Um, so my former school, uh, you know, very rural Appalachia, so not a heavy industry base. And yeah, we simply started doing things like, let's become a member of the Chamber of Commerce and actually go to the meetings. Yeah. Uh, and build relationships. And, and so circling back to, I think Lydia, where you started this conversation is relationship. That's what it's all about, you know, and taking students to the Chamber of Commerce meeting so that they, you know, a student is meeting a local plant manager or a local physician or whatever. And those conversations would inevitably lead to ideas that students would bring back to us and say, hey, Mr. O, can we work on a project like this? Yeah, let's find a way. And then the students then have the initiative to want to lead that and design the project, co-design that with us. And that's, by the way, just throwing that out there, the best project is when you co-design it with students from day one, just say it. Um, but again, this is a, you know, very rural community where the community members have been asked for years, like to help sponsor a spaghetti dinner mm -hmm. or hang a banner at the high school gym or whatever. They have not been asked. Uh, what is that 10th idea on your priority list so that we can work with you? And we would consistently have members of the community, engineers, um, you know, paralegals, nurses, um, you name it, in our school, working side by side with kids, helping them solve real problems, acting as mentors, acting as coaches. And that was so powerful to see. Now, 
you know, could could I as the teacher somehow get offended by that? I suppose, that, you know, in some other planet, but I loved it because I saw that that was the way that these kids were seeing the windows of possibility open up for them in ways they had never experienced before. I think, Amity, was, was it you that talked about the feedback loops? And I keep thinking about the feedback loop as really enriching the relationship and the, the depth of the project and the depth of the work experiences available to the students um, and to the community members. I know that there are some um, questions in the chat box and I don't want to um, ignore our participants today. There's a couple of questions about one-to-one -one mentorship. Um, what does that look like? And also how parents might be engaged in this work. Um, so if, if anyone wants to jump in on that, um, happy to happy to take some more questions from our audience. <laughs> Before it, Anne, I saw your mute come off. <laughs> oh no, go ahead. Uh, well, um, parents, I think, you know, that's an important part. Uh, one of the, I, I think, lessons uh, we learned the hard way was not being super transparent with parents, uh, no pun intended there, but just, you know, the more information you can share, because this is a different approach. This is not what they experienced in, you know, whether K through 12, whatever uh, area it is. I mean, this is a, this is something that's surprisingly different, mm -hmm. but the cool thing is even um, the parents who were most resistant initially, and no surprise that came from kids, the parents of kids who had learned how to play the game, learned how to jump through the hoops to get the A or whatever they wanted. Um, now you're changing the game. You're saying, well, no, we're going to actually de-silo the process. And your student is not going to be just writing essays and doing worksheets. They're going to be, you know, working one-to-one -one with folks in the community. Uh, you need to front load that with information to make sure they clearly understand that. And then the cool thing is, now, what we found, some of the comments was, um, you know, my high school student is actually talking at the dinner table again when I ask, what did you do at school today? Oh, my gosh, let me tell you, as opposed to nothing. Uh, so, <laughs> right. So they these, you know, that that was who going back to relationships, we were able to foster these relationships that then became our strongest advocates. So I don't underestimate the power of parents as well as just members of the community. Tell your story early and often, invite people in to see what the students are doing. And in that process, they're gonna go, whoa, this is the kind of school I wish I had attended. Yeah. Yeah, just and to add to that, there, there, I wish I'd written down the name. Someone made this comment earlier that in terms of like students interest in this kind of work, you know, peer referral, parent influence, like, I mean, that's where the buzz is, right? So a, another student said, hey, you really should take this, this class, or a parent says, I heard about this thing, you should look at it. You know, parents, I think, really understand this. And, and Ben, I completely agree with it. I think kind of the way of working is different, but I think there's like, they get it, right? But, and I wish I was trying to find this quickly. I'll, I'll keep looking for it. But there was some survey that was done recently, right? I'm going to get this roughly, roughly right. Forgive me for the lack of details. But, you know, parents were surveyed sort of for your child, if you could get a guaranteed internship at Google or admissions to Harvard, which would you pick? And the majority picked Google. I think we're seeing a real shift in terms mm -hmm. of people understanding the value of this profession-based learning. Um, you know, we are seeing we are seeing schools bring. This is true of both high schools and two and four-year colleges, right? They are putting front and center on their their pay, their marketing pages, their website pages, saying we will you know we will work with your students to get them real-world experience, profession-based experience, mm -hmm. whatever they're calling it, like. So I think parents are a huge advocate and I, and I think finding ways to be sure they know about this, again, just as was said earlier today, t tell the story, right? Communicate this to counselors and great other great programs in your school, but be sure parents know too and, and they really will support the work. Absolutely. I mean, that really speaks to like, how do we catalyze, right? So beyond the folks who yeah. have been doing this long-term, 
how do we how do we start how do we maintain how do we continue to engage in um coaching and partnerships um Jessica, I don't know if you wanted to jump in and talk about some of the strategies you've used around, um, you know, moving towards a more learner-centered uh, approach or? Yeah, I, I will say, um, and this has kind of been learning on my side too, is just exactly how to empower students to be able to advocate for themselves. And so, um, and I kind of learned this through a student I had named Noah, who came to me and he said he really wanted to be in the candy business. He's been obsessed with gummy bears like his whole life and wrote essays about them. And it, it was just a, a very unusual kind of uh, affection towards candy. Um, and he was like, so I really want to do a project or an internship in candy like Hershey's or Haribo candy or the candy department at Walmart. And I didn't have any candy contacts at all. And so um, he ended up getting on LinkedIn and was like, well, let's just see who works in the candy business in Northwest Arkansas. And he sat down and, and basically cold call or, you know, LinkedIn message a, a couple of guys from Haribo Candy and said, you know, hey, I'm in high school. I'm really interested in business and the candy business. Can I just have 30 minutes of your time to chat? And I mean, who's going to say no to that? And so we ended up going over to Haribo Candy and having this conversation. And he was like, the, the senior vice president of Haribo was like, it's interesting that you're here because I've been trying to get in the high school concession stands for their sports because we want to sell Haribo Candy during the soccer games, the basketball games, the football games, but I didn't know who to contact. So is that something that you'd like to work on? And so I, sometimes these things just happen when you, you know, put it out there. So, you know, even though I may not have had a, a contact, just building up that, that personal profile on LinkedIn, their website, they've had a project or two under their belt. So they're more confident about having that conversation. And just, I love the CAPS model where, you know, I have two and a half hours with students every day. So there's literally time to go over and, you know, have a 30 minute conversation with someone that's not directly aligned to our curriculum, but it's one of those things that's creating some momentum for our program. Jessica, if I could um, pick up on, on what you just said about like, I didn't personally have any contacts, right? I often, you know, if, if we take a bit of a turn and we start to look more at the, the diversity, equity, um, inclusion perspective in this work, Talk to me about how you help build those networks like Julia um, Fisher Freeland was talking about, or um, you know, where are the places and spaces that educators can help extend those networks and the social capital for students? And I'm picking up on what you said about the, you know, the coaching and the network that you had available. Yeah, I, I, it's tough. Um, and I will say this is, I'm going into my fifth year doing this. Um, but I would really say it's, it's really about, uh, one, the momentum we can get from having, you know, 20, 40 students in the class and then running through some projects, being confident enough to then go out and share that message. You know, so then we have this exponential messaging happening within our community because like Ben said you know my students are going home and his, his mom's like well what'd you do today and he's like I had this guest speaker and we did we're going to start this project and all these things going on and then mom goes and talks about it to other people and so our network really starts to build organically just from kind of this you know word of mouth and these you know one-off experiences that are happening in the classroom. Um, Amity, I'm going to put you on the spot again, because uh, this was one of the things that we intentionally pushed you and your team when Open Way Learning was working with uh, your school district this summer, is, is we said, we because we're really leaning into this idea of co-design, we said, we want you to go out in the community, find spaces, find contacts, so that we can really understand what these projects are going to look like. So just you know, and I, I think we what, gave you like a week's notice. So tell us how you work because you pulled it off beautifully. And so you and, and Dave maybe want to kick in how you how you actually did that as an example of you can consider this like climbing Mount Everest, but it's not that hard. You can actually make these community connections happen pretty easily. 
Yeah, Ben, it was it was super exciting because it, it wasn't that any one of us did it, right? It was that, you know, in, in the process of co-creation, it was how do you connect with your community and how do you, you know, make that, make those experiences really relevant um, for what's going on right there in the community. So we put it out to the whole group, right? And said, can we make this happen? Are there things that we can do with, the, with all of us together that is an experience within our community? And it was absolutely amazing. I mean, they they could have filled three weeks worth of, you know, time with all the different ideas that they had, and and each person brought something different to the table, and everybody agreed to try it. We were talking just this morning about how important it was to be able to step outside our comfort zone and and do some things that we might have been really nervous to do, um, and making the commitment to do that made it so much better and so much richer. And we learned all of us learned things about our community that we didn't know that we can now build on later as we do more projects. That's great. And do you want to jump on? I just I was loving that comment. There's just something so powerful about just kind of just kind of levels the playing field when everybody kind of shows up and isn't totally sure what to do back to Karen that messiness that chaos that we're not totally and I mean there's just something really neat about that and I think that just this idea too of just this collective effort um, and this shared purpose and then all the natural relationships that that come out of this um, I, a lot of people are commenting on this in the chat too so clear in this kind of work there's, there's two-way value, right? We're, I think we're so accustomed to mm -hmm. business doing favors for schools and kids. And it's this like very one-way transactional value. This is like two-way value because the business is benefiting too. And somebody, again, I wish I'd written their name down earlier today, made this, said actually they're tracking this. Um, and, and we're doing this as well, which I think is one of the first things we put in front of businesses, right? Is, we ask businesses, this is what the participant was saying, um, you know, have, has this added value? And, you know, we ask like, will you actually use ideas that you've heard in student pitches? I mean, our, our numbers right now are right around 90% of businesses say yes. So, I mean, but this just speaks to, so like all this great stuff you're hearing, like capture it, measure it, share it out. Like this two-way value is a really unique proposition for this kind of learning. A hundred percent. I mean, and it also speaks to the ability for this kind of work to start to close opportunity gaps as well for young people and for communities that the idea of there being a two way relationship that is um, not as hierarchical. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Can can I just add to that please. too? Jessica said something earlier too that like, so we know from research, right, that that students of color in particular have less access to research, uh, to internship type experiences, therefore social capital. Jessica, you made the comment about like LinkedIn and like professional profiles, all those things. Like, I just want to use this as a plug to like be sure students understand that even if it's an experience that is in school, that's part of their school day, this kind of CAPS work, this kind of profession-based learning, they should be putting on their LinkedIn profile as an internship. And, and we literally have had students ask us if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Like if they're doing, ours is, you know, teamship, but like if they're doing teamship and it's because it's in school. So they're like, yeah, but school's not, <laughs> school's not real stuff. Like, no, we're like, no, you should, you are adding real value to a business. If that isn't an internship, I don't know what is, right? So, but I just want to say like really coaching them on that and coaching them Students will often say too, like, ah, you know, high school kids don't do LinkedIn, but they can. Um, I pasted in a, a, an article from one of our alum and he just wrote this awesome piece about networking and how he just started doing this and the dividends it's paid. They have no idea. They have no idea. So again, I think it's, it's inside of them, they can do it. We can help that really bring this out of them just sometimes by giving them permission. Yeah, put it on LinkedIn, start a profile page. Mm -hmm. Totally okay. Totally okay, and totally public so that you can continue to develop those connections. Yeah. And, and, and th th those things, again, back to the survey data, how do businesses hire? Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this is true whether you look at regional skills surveys or not. 
Businesses hire people they know. Mm -hmm. If you are not in that network, you're probably not going to get the job. And the reality is, is you go head to head with someone, you could have the same technical skills, the same resume. If they, if you're in their network and you're not, in networks getting the job. It's just the way the world works. So th this is critical, and and particularly speaks to this issue around access and equity. Absolutely. I, I like to add to what what Ann just said too. Um, because, I, and I don't know how many programs are like this, but uh, in our program, we have students apply and interview for our program, um, which is great because it makes them kind of think about, you know, is this something that I really want? And this is going to be half of my school day. And do I really want to be a part of it? But on, on the back side of that, we want to make sure when we are selecting kids for the program that our you know, demographic breakout matches what our school looks like. Because, you know, a lot of the students can come in and they're, you know, mom or dad works in business and they know to wear a blazer and they know to bring a resume and they've been coached up on interview questions. And just, you know, as the person who's selecting students, are you thinking about, you know, where's everybody coming from when they come to that interview? And am I allowing them more points in this interview uh, because they've been prepped and come from an environment where that's normal? So we, we think about that before we send out like the yeses and the nos for, for our program is to just take, take you know, one step back and look and see if that, if our numbers match what our student population looks like. And then just, I think, just, oh, yeah, can I interrupt just real quick and say, ask, how do you determine that? Because I, I think that that's like such a critical um, piece of, of these relationships. I, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I would love for you to be able to share, like, how do you go about doing that? Uh, <laughs> the recruiting time frame is, uh, it's a lot. Um, tracking students' applications, uh, scheduling them for interviews, and then pulling all their, their data from their mm -hmm. individual schools to see, you know, what that looks like. But luckily, you know, our, our director and our administration has helped be able to pull these big, you know, data pulls so that we can actually look and make sure that we're, we're doing the right thing by students. That's amazing to have that kind of support. Um, but but I think also in in two when I'm putting my class together is that you know there's students that were amazing you know you want them a part of the class great but then there's a, a you know a handful of students who I look at and say you know would they bring something into the class that I don't have already and especially in global business if I have someone who's you know meets certain criteria that would benefit the entire class you know I'm I have support to be able to add that student in, even though, you know, they may not have been agreeing on my interview process, but maybe they're from a different country or maybe they're non-Christian or a person of color or something that's not represented in the class that will benefit not just that student, but the other students in the class who will learn how to work with someone. Um, but then the last piece I'll say is, you know, as we've talked about pulling in business partners and guest speakers, is that I'm very conscious about who I put in front of my students. So as far as, you know, if I'm bringing in people from the community and saying, look students, here's who has power in our business community. What do those people look like? And so just kind of, you know, I always say tracking, but kind of looking at who am I putting in front of students? And um, am I giving equal representation to what our diverse community looks like? and it being okay to kind of go out and recruit some specific guest speakers because I need some students in my class to see those people represented in the business community. Absolutely, absolutely. Go ahead, Ben. Well, um, you know, I kind of stole my own thunder when I introduced myself because, but this is, this is really the, the essence of why I'm, I'm so passionate about this work is, um, you know, I can, think back to very specific names of students that I worked with that I am absolutely convinced that it were not for the public district school of choice that I worked at that happened to say we're going to do the hard work of going wall-to-wall -wall project based learning you know community facing type of and, and let me be clear we had no additional funding for doing projects uh, I taught out of a hand-me-down trailer for all 11 years. 
um, which was kind of wonderful because I could do whatever I wanted. Um, <laughs> but it, I want, I really want to emphasize that sometimes people think, well, oh, this, this takes such a heavy lift in terms of funding. You know, no, you just have to be creative. You have to first start with who are your students, build the, those relationships with the students, understand what makes them tick, understand what they want to do, and then find ways to, to make that happen. And then through projects, uh, you know, hold them to high expectations, but give them those just-in-time support every day, every day, which is which is certainly hard work. Um, and and I think the other thing that that is is really important is is this idea of shared power and agency because we hear student voice and choice all the time, and I think we give a lot of that tokenism um, of saying, oh, they got to choose the blue worksheet versus the green worksheet. Uh, that's not voice and choice. True voice and choice is saying, what do you care about? Let's co-design a project uh, together uh, and, and do something that is going to help provide you that understanding your purpose and where does your purpose carry now and in the future um, so that they're not getting, as the I think the previous uh, session I said, you're, you're not getting in your junior year of college and figuring out, you know, I really didn't want to get into whatever that field is, that, that you get that, that either, and it doesn't necessarily have to come that you have that direct experience with it, but you just get a better understanding of the world of work and what people are expecting in this global innovation economy we live in when you're doing these types of profession project experiential based learning environment. So um, yeah, it's, it absolutely, I have seen it close the opportunity gap um, and I could rattle off name after name after name, but I, I won't. But it's uh, it's truly impactful. It's not easy. And that's one of the other misconceptions that, oh, it, you know, it would be much easier for me to sit down and say, open your textbook to page 73, read the text and answer the question in the back of the book. Uh, this is hard work, but it's infinitely more uh, rewarding in value. I see a comment from Beth along those lines that there are times when educators are shocked by the kind of success that students who maybe haven't been successful in other arenas with regards to school can be. I mean, think about needing to be engaged and connected to what you're doing and what you're learning seems pretty critical for most learners. Others can do school, right? They can they know how to do the tests and the reading and the textbook. But having been a middle school and high school English teacher, when when I had that, that kind of work, oftentimes it felt like I was dragging bodies behind me as opposed to like they're running out in front of me. <laughs> Not a lovely image, but <laughs> you know, midway through the school year. <laughs> Yeah, Lydia, I want to just lift this point up because as educators, like what this says to me is the students themselves don't necessarily know they'd be great at this work. So we've got to go out and tap them on the shoulder, right? I mean, that is exactly what happened to Jordan, the self-proclaimed wallflower. The young man that I put in the chat, Manuhe Abebe, he ne I mean, an adult came to him and said, you would be great at this. Um, so I just like really that... It's because they don't have a lot of chances to do this kind of real world work. So how would you possibly know if you're good at it or not? So if you're in school and you're going through your normal day and you're, you know, a sort of medium of the road student, you're doing fine, you're doing, but you're not knocking it out of the park, right? These kinds of profession based, that, that sounds hard, it sounds scary. <laughs> Invite them in. I just, I, it's such a huge point because they will, they may not see the strengths that Lydia you're describing. Well, yes, absolutely. Um, I am looking at the time and I know we have 15 minutes. Um, I'm gonna put a, a question for everyone in the chat box, which is what from you all, um, panelists, guests, um, what is a strategy or a practice that you would recommend to folks who are joining us today in order to make that authentic shift because it is hard work and you have to start somewhere. What would you recommend? What would you, what would you offer? Let me start with that because um, it, it hints to something that I, again, I'm, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I can't remember who said it, but it was profound. But uh, this, this idea of building the collaborative network, uh, I think that is so, so 
to me, that was the biggest culture shock coming from industry into education is that we don't talk to one another. We don't talk to our colleagues across the hall. We don't talk to colleagues within our districts. We don't talk between districts. I think one of the, perhaps, I don't want to push this too hard, but one of the potential silver linings of the pandemic is that it, I think it forced a lot of educators to actually do something they've never done and collaborate. So, so that would be my recommendation. And that means reaching out to your community partners like Amity emphasized. Um, that means reaching out to other teachers, you know, the power of network. If, if you are struggling with, how do I do this? You know, connect with other teachers who are doing the similar work and, and build that community of practice so that you can share ideas with one another. And that is the, the final idea item under this umbrella of collaboration is don't be afraid to share. Tell your story. Let's, this is wonderful, wonderful work that's happening in our schools, but we don't tell that story enough. Let's regather around the narrative and make it positive rather than, oh, you know, schools are failing, yada, yada, yada. There's too many bright things that are happening. So collaborate and share your story, your ideas, build that network and, and Amazing things will happen. I think for me, um, don't laugh. I'm this. You're, you're seeing my inner nerdy, my inner nerdy side. I'm going to go back to this coaching piece. So this link in here is is uh, a really great construct that I've used in all aspects of my life, but really around coaching is called the ladder of inference. So the strategy that I would say has been hugely helpful to shift to this sort of not teaching content, but coaching experience, which are really different things. One of the strategies or practices as a coach that, that, that we employ is this idea of, of get down the ladder. And if you, if you read this, the sort of idea is basically to say like at the bottom of a ladder is sort of all available data, but that is at the level of the data. So what do people actually say? For example, what do you actually see them do as opposed to up the ladder, which are inferences or all the meaning making that, that all the layers that we put on it. Right. So my, my, my strategy would be, as you're making this shift as a coach of experience, Practice getting back down the ladder and trying to see more. You will find as you do that, you're, you're, you will realize that we oftentimes, because we are teachers of content, spend a lot of time looking for what's not there. They're missing this. They're not doing this well. They don't have this yet. You've got to make a shift, we would argue, to be great coaches of profession-based learning to get back down the ladder and see more and see what they are doing. <laughs> Where is that early evidence that they are building a team dynamic? Where is that early evidence that they are breaking down that complexity? I, if it's helpful, I threw some of the mindsets that we coach toward, but you'll see in that mindsets language, look for early evidence of those mindsets. So, so that what I would say is, and you can read about the ladder of inference, it's actually pretty easy to grasp conceptually, but it's very hard to do. Get back down the ladder and try to really observe your students for what they are doing, not just what they're not doing. Mm, and building on strengths. Building right on there. strengths. I, 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 it is like such a profound shift for many of the educators that we work with again and I, I i mean i again i was a middle school science teacher like that this was the world i lived in and i didn't really realize this i didn't really realize what i was doing mm -hmm. until i re really started focusing on the difference about coaching experience absolutely yeah jessica do you want to jump in yeah, I have just, you know, kind of a, an, uh, a strategy I used this year, which I didn't realize how important, it's really simple, but it was very important as I reflected on the year and had, you know, students reflect as well. But when I do projects, I group students in, you know, groups of three or four, but at every different project, I have them work with a different team. And, and there's a lot of, you know, tools out there like random group makers and things like that. But I would intentionally put students together who hadn't worked together before so that they went through a project. They, you know, we talked about all these essential skills they're supposed to be using and they go, mm, maybe I should have done this a little bit differently. Then they're with the next project. It's almost like they get a, a whole new start. 
with a new group and they get to practice again. And so, and, and we did this because I really wanted everyone in the class to get to know everyone else. But I think, especially in the time of, of COVID, but too, just for their you know, mental health, um, the students really, you know, we developed a sense of community because they all knew each other from working with each other. And, you know, a lot of the students even commented about how many friends they had made or, you know, even a mom reached out to me saying how happy she was that her, her son was having friends over to his house again. And so just intentionally think about that, you know, the projects are great. We work with these amazing business partners on these real world problems, but giving time and space for them to develop these you know, social skills and, and confidence going into, you know, one project after the other. Because I think that was a kind of a foundational piece that they started to develop confidence and not just their skills, but their, their communication abilities too. And so just the energy and engagement project after project, it, it just kept building in the classroom. And, and I think the students really appreciated uh, being able to make friends and have a sense of community through that. Kind of like locking arms and walking together. Um, through the last year, but then well beyond. Dave, do you um, do you mind sharing what you what you put in the chat box? Because I think that I think that that's so critical from um, an educator's perspective. Sure, the uh, the taking the time out of uh, from curriculum to get to know students. Sure, um, yeah, especially when it comes to trying to facilitate a uh, process of experiential learning, um, knowing the students plays such an important important role in that and a timeout from curriculum doesn't mean that you necessarily have to stop the process either it can be integrated in the process and and um, getting to know students in that in that way too um, so I you know had previously worked on you know student um, good good classroom climate and culture but I'm going to take that to another level now and really dive deeper into uh, understanding and I teach middle school, uh, eighth grade, and uh, really understanding what student interests are, what they think that they might want to pursue in the future, or some areas that they don't know about that I can expose them to that they haven't been, um, that they maybe hadn't thought of previously. Yeah. Karen, do you want to jump in and, and share any of the strategies you're using from your coaching training? Um, something that might be useful for folks joining us today? Um, so I actually haven't implemented uh, some of the coaching sessions, but one thing that I do foresee implementing um, is really focusing on the uh, strategies and, and mindsets. So um, one thing I've shared, especially in our uh, training phase for District C coaches, is um, the fact that having so little control of how the boat might go um, especially when it's student led is a bit scary, but I'm, I think that's one really big way to make sure that students have such an authentic experience. So yes, we poke the raft a little bit. That's something that we like to say often in District C, but sometimes after we poke the raft, the students might decide that they go a different way. And if they do go that different way, um, then I think that's something that I am learning to embrace. So not dragging the boat back to where I want them to go, uh, but letting them experience something new, which is why even with the same tools and with the same mindsets, um, each cycle is gonna be so different and so much more authentic and valuable for the students. So I think really just like relinquishing control is, is something that I've been working on. It's talk about not easy. <laughs> And if you have administrators who are worried about the level of noise coming from your classroom, you can just say, well, that's the sound of learning. <laughs> Amity, Donna, would you like to jump in and share um, any strategies that you recommend or, or um, you know, any additions? <laughs> Sorry, lost my words. <laughs> sure. I, 
we what we did this summer was was to start small. So we were having trouble sort of launching experiential learning as something that we do as a district because we're a super traditional community. And so people were genuinely afraid for the future of their students. You know, what is that going to look like for college admissions and how is that going to play on the SAT? And and they were coming from a place of genuinely caring about their kids, right? Their students. And so, you know, that's really valuable. So we said, what if we try it during the summer? What if we do this little thing? that's a bonus that's an extra that everyone can access and it's amazing how that changed and now we have some data that says this works and so now it's easier for people to to try this in a more traditional classroom setting because we know it works and we have students saying that they loved it and they can't wait to come back to school yeah yeah wonderful donna i know you put a little comment you put a comment in the chat box as well well, and I think just to piggyback off of Amini, like it, even if you're doing this for the first time, like ask the business, hey, we want to pilot this, we want to test it, and it's a shorter commitment for them, even, you know, and and they're kind of in it with you doing the same thing. Um, but I, I definitely recommend getting your your business and your community involved. I know Jessica's even gotten our um, city involved, and some of the kids have done projects for them or even internships. So. There are people out there that want to help and want to get involved and are going to believe in the program. Absolutely. Folks, we have about five minutes left. So let me preview what happens next um, at 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. We will reconvene and connect um, on a closing session, uh, reflecting on what we are taking away today. I want to thank all of our guests, uh, Jessica and Ben. Dave, Amity, Donna, Karen, and Chris Wood, who served as our bouncer. Luckily, we didn't need him today. Thank you all um, so much. I do hope you'll take a moment um, to connect with one another, to share emails, to um, take a look at these resources. And um, if there are other suggestions and, and strategies, I'll keep the chat box open. We have about four more minutes. Feel free to uh, you know, brainstorm and throw them out there because I think we are all looking for some some ideas on how we go forward. Thank you all so much.